we'll get started in just a few minutes as I know people are still hopping on and getting going, but uh, just wanted to take a moment and thank you for taking an hour out of your day, whether it's the afternoon or morning, wherever you're coming from. And uh, just thank you for spending time with us as you obviously see this as a valuable tool to add to your toolbox and so do we. That's why we created this webinar and hope that you find value from it. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we will spend time uh, with Q&A, so we'll open it up for questions. So on that chat uh, window, there's also a tab for Q&A. If you have a question for us to discuss at the end, feel free to add it right there in the Q&A tab. That way, all the questions are there in one spot and we can get to them at the end. Also, you will find links at the end of our slides today for uh, some resources that you can link to or download and also ways for you to get in contact with me if you would like to talk more about church communication or project management or however we as Church Juice can support your ministry. The last thing I want to point out real quick is that there is also a tab there on the right side of your window, uh, or at least on mine. Uh, there's a tab for handouts. So if you click on that, you will get uh, uh, all of today's slides as a PDF document. So you can follow along, print it out, add notes, whatever you want to do there, or just come back to it later as well. So let's get started. Uh, we're already a few minutes in, so don't want to uh, take too much of your day. Uh, hope to honor your time as well. So let me introduce first who we are as a ministry. If you are new to Church Juice, we are a resource that is commun com committed to church communications, and we are here energizing church communications. That's what we say that we do, and that's what we hope that we bring with every free article and resource like this webinar, uh, with every podcast episode, and everything that we do is meant to serve and support the area of church communications, which is obviously a broad area of ministry, and it covers so much, and so we try to help you as um, as leaders in your church uh, do the best that you can in your church communication role. Everything we do is free. Everything that we provide to you is free uh, as part of our ministry to churches. And so make sure that you sign up for our emails or you know subscribe to our podcast, get all of the latest resources. And if there's anything that we can do for your church individually, make sure that you reach out to us and we'd love to meet with you, consult with you, uh, talk through how you can um, improve your effective communications to your congregation, to your community, and all of that as well. My name is Brian Haley. I'm the producer of Church Juice. Um, you can read my bio there, but uh, I started in church communications in 2009 as a 20-year-old, I believe, uh, coming in uh, in college, coming in as a church communicator in a church in the Detroit area. And I grew into uh, several positions in that ministry and did a lot of things with communication and event planning, uh, worship planning, outreach, all types of things. So that's really how I got my start in ministry. And then over the last several years, um, I've been involved in church website design, uh, been involved here at Church Juice for the last five years and been serving in the local church as well. Uh, I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan with my family. Uh, and I just love uh, helping churches. And so now that COVID is uh, hopefully for the most part behind us, I'm excited to meet face to face with a lot of churches again. And so if that's something that we can do to serve you, uh, make sure you reach out to us as well. So let's dive into today's topic. Let me start with this key um, fundamental truth, and that is that ch church communicators are project managers. And I think that's something that we overlook a lot of times and something that we don't really think about. Uh, project management is kind of a newer term, a newer role that has continued to evolve over the last several years, and I think will continue to evolve in the coming years as well. But what we'll see in the next few slides is that a major part of what church communications is and what church communicators as the leaders do is we're managing projects all the time uh, from various sizes and in a variety of roles. And so you'll see how your role, whatever it actually is, your role um, is really project management. And so we want to provide you tools today, just fundamental tools to get you um, acquainted with project management, because like I said, it's kind of a new 
new area, new discipline, um, but it's also one that a lot of churches can learn from and can implement in their ministry. And I think a lot of communicators can implement pretty easily in the way that we approach communications uh, and the way that we uh, approach our creation of communication as well. So I'm guessing that if you are involved in church communications, you have some sort of these types of responsibilities in your job description or really in your day to day interactions. You are probably doing some sort of social media management. You are worried about the email messages to your congregation. You are planning the messages of upcoming events. You're coordinating with ministry leader pro, uh, leaders about programs and event logistics. You're probably assisting with the upcoming sermon series, whether that's graphics or otherwise. You're managing the content calendar for several communications platforms, not just social media, but also your website and whatever else you have as well, maybe an app, uh, whatever that looks like. You also try to create consistency in messaging through all of your mediums, through all the ways that you are communicating to both your congregation and the community at large. And that probably involves some brand um, brand policing as well. You are also probably managing expectations for a variety of outcomes from a variety of ministry leaders and trying to manage a variety of uh, personalities as well. You receive tasks. You also are hopefully delegating tasks, whether that's back to the ministry leader or that's a volunteer team, or maybe that's something that you need to develop as a volunteer team. And that would be another task that you're worried about. You're building positive relationships with the people in your congregation, with the people in your surrounding community that you're trying to reach, and also with the staff and ministry leaders and other stakeholders, council members, uh, elders, deacons, whatever that looks like. You're developing strategy for bridging the gap, especially in this post-pandemic world, bridging the gap of online and offline communication. You're managing expectations and information from a variety of audience, from uh, the women's Bible study leader to the worship pastor to whatever else. Um, you are providing points of connection both throughout the week for your church members and also throughout people's discipleship stage. So how do they get connected from one step to the next? And of course, everyone's favorite responsibility on their job description, other tasks as assigned. And if I know you as a church communicator, there's probably a lot that goes along with that. But I'm guessing that you're probably not thinking about all of these things as project management. But really, if you look through this list, you can see how much you are really, really managing and how many uh, different projects, different interacting, different simultaneously happening projects are all going on at the same time. And your responsibility is to execute all of these things with the best quality and with the best timeliness and on budget. Uh, and so these are, at its essence, project management. And that's what all of these things are doing. So what does a project manager do? A project manager at its very core oversees projects that drive success. Now, your church, your staff, your uh, leadership team defi defines what success is. And you are driving toward that with everything you do as you're project managing. All the projects that you, uh, that you are overseeing, that you are implementing, that you are part of, all of those projects should be driving toward what you as your church defines as success. That's probably somewhere in your mission statement or somewhere along with your mission. But everything that you do should be moving towards success or completion of that uh, of that goal, of that target, of that mission. And if it's not, then you're probably wasting your time or wasting other people's time. So at its core, a project manager oversees projects that drive towards success. Let's dive into that a little bit more. Project management might look like being a change agent. That could be updating your brand. That could be updating your website. That could be helping people move toward further steps in their discipleship process. Being a change agent doesn't mean that you're necessarily in charge, but you may be help, helping to implement change that other people have decided as well. Project management also looks like working well under pressure. And I've never met a church communicator that does well in their position that is not working well under pressure. Every church communicator, every church admin, every church staff member works well under pressure because there is always uh, opinions. There is always uh, deadlines. Sunday happens every week. Right. So everyone who's a project manager, who is a church communicator, who is a church leader, you work well under pressure. Project management also 
looks like cultivating people skills to develop trust. And I think that's something that maybe we overlook or we don't really think a whole lot about sometimes. But a lot of what we do in ministry is cultivating people skills because we are trying to develop trust, whether that's so we can present the gospel as an outreach oriented message. Or maybe that's helping people further along in their family worship or their discipleship or coming along in their faith formation. So we are, as project managers, cultivating people skills because hopefully as part of your role, you are also working on building volunteer teams and involving volunteers throughout the process. So hopefully you are cultivating those skills. You're learning how to be a better communicator. You're learning how to listen better. And as a result, you are developing trust. And that is a key role to project management that I don't want us to undermine or forget about um, or look over. The last thing that I would say project management might look like is that you are adapting the approach to each project. What I mean by that is that there is no one size fits all for project management. So you understand if you've been in this role for any length of time that there is no one size fits all to church communication. How you communicate for a youth event looks vastly different than how you might communicate a senior citizen event or an outreach event or a sermon series. So each project looks different and there's no one size fits all for your projects. So project management involves adapting your approach. And so we're going to dive into that a little bit uh, in today's presentation. But um, but make sure that you're thinking through how do you adapt for each project that you're uh, that you're engaging with in church communications as well. So the church communications project manager, I think, boils down to three main areas, planning and organizing, managing tasks and influencing change. What I mean by planning and organizing is that you are taking projects that are coming to you and you are figuring out how to get them done. As part of that, you also figure out what tasks need to be completed to meet the project. So to complete the project, you need to do A, B, C, and D, and you need to do it by this time, and that's managing tasks. And I'm guessing you probably have a lot of tasks in a lot of areas, so that requires planning and organizing. And the last thing is that you're influencing change. So as a church communicator, as a project manager, like I just talked about a minute ago, you are influencing change, whether you are the senior pastor or you are a volunteer church communicator, you're influencing change by implementing projects all throughout the variety of ways that you are communicating as a church. And the ways that you do that as a result is influencing change. So these are the three core areas that you will find any church communicator, any project manager being involved in. So what does that look like? Well, we see that project managers add value to their organizations in key ways. That include or prioritization, delegation, and effective communication. This is part of uh, Google's project manager fundamental um, certification course. So they define project managers as this. They're adding value in key ways. They are prioritizing, they are delegating, and they are being effective in their communication. So let's adapt that definition just a little bit. We see church communicators, and I think this is true. Church communicators add value to their churches in key ways that include prioritization, delegation, and effective communication. If you're going to be a church communicator and you're going to add value to their church, to your church, there are key ways that you're doing that. You are prioritizing what needs to be communicated and how it's going to be communicated. You are delegating tasks or projects to your volunteers or to the ministry leaders, whether that's a handout to give to their people or whatever, you at some point are delegating. And part of delegation is also receiving or being delegated to. And last, you can't be a church communicator without effective communication. Otherwise, you're just a project manager. So effective communication is key to being a good quality um, church communicator that is thriving in your role. So I think this definition is great for us as we head into looking at the, the fundamentals of church communication, project management, and what that looks like. So keep this in mind uh, or use that handout and mark this page and come back to it and think through what does my role look like? How am I adding value to my church in these ways? Or what do I need to improve on? Or what do I need to work on? Uh, where do I need to change how I'm thinking through and receiving and delegating? Um, 
So think through this, and I would love to hear your comments on what you think about this definition as well. So let's move into project management itself and understanding what project management is, what it looks like, how to use it, uh, and that's really what we're going to spend the core of today's time together looking at. The project life cycle is something that you'll hear anytime you're involved with project management, um, whether in church communications or otherwise. There are four phases of the project life cycle. It starts with initiating, it moves to planning, then to executing, and then to closing. And you'll see how this is a cycle, and we're going to go through each one of these in just a moment. But this is a cycle because as you close one project, you should be receiving feedback and evaluating to make changes for the next project. So let's dive into what this looks like. First is initiating the project. This is the first phase of any project. And I'll get into what I think about this looks like for church communications in a little bit. But let's start with just the fundamentals as project management. Initiate the project is the very first phase of any project management that you are involved with. So initiating the project means that you are defining the project goals and you are also looking at the deliverables. You're deciding what the deliverables are, how to deliver them. Uh, and what I mean by that is maybe it's a website update, maybe it's an email. Uh, so for, for church communications, the deliverables would be how we are communicating this. Initiating the project. Another part is identifying the budget and resources needed. So oftentimes in most churches that I've worked with, we don't really think about the budget. It's an afterthought, right? Uh, we don't think ahead about how we are going to budget our time, how we are going to budget what we are outsourcing, like printing or materials or whatever. We figure out the cost and then figure out how to budget for it later. And in most churches that I've interacted with, there's not a communications budget either. So an important part of initiating the project is being proactive and figuring out what that budget is, whether that's time or money or whatever. So figuring out what that budget is, how it's going to be allocated, where it's coming from, and then the resources that are needed to get that done as well. Another area of initiating the project is to gather all of the details in one place. And I think this is a player, a, an area that I needed to grow in uh, and figure out too, because when we gather a project together, we get a project assigned to us, we often just dive into the tasks and getting it done. But we gather all the details when we're initiating the project. We gather that all in one place. And later I'll talk about how we do that and what that looks like. And last, you get project approval. So this may be going back to the ministry leader or whatever stakeholder is involved and getting their approval. These are the things that we think are the goals for this project. These are what we are going to deliver. This is the time it's going to take. These are the resources. This is the cost. Uh, and having all of that get approved before actually, before actually moving into the getting it done phase. So you get project approval, then you move into making a plan. What we, what we mean when we say that we are making a plan is that we are actually defining things further. We are looking at those goals that we decided, the deliverables and the outcomes that we decided on when we were initiating the project. And we're looking at how we're going to meet those goals. We're going to create a breakdown and include all of the tasks that are needed to complete the project. We are going to look at the responsibilities for each person involved in this project and how we are going to communicate with one another as a project manager, how you are going to oversee the project and the responsibilities and communication. We are also in making a plan going to create a schedule, create deadlines and look at contingencies. What happens if something goes wrong? What happens if uh, the printer can't get those back to us in time? What are, uh, what are other ways if something goes wrong that we can still get this to you, whether that's an altered deadline or whatever? we create contingencies too. Creating a plan, making a plan is important because that helps drive success and that helps move us toward quality execu execution in the way that we are communicating both to our congregation, but also to the people involved in the project and in managing the, the execution of the ministry, of the event, whatever that is. After we make a plan, it's time to execute. So you'll see the first two phases is, are both before we're actually working on the project itself. We're planning. We're thinking through these details. 
The third step, third step of four, is to execute and complete tasks. So your role as the church communicator is probably to do a lot of this yourself or to use your team or to use your, uh, your agency that you work with, whatever that looks like. In this phase, you are monitoring tasks and deadlines. You are looking at them, making sure that things are on, uh, on pace and that you are ahead of deadlines or at deadlines. You are also keeping your team motivated. So this involves over communication with all of your stakeholders, your volunteers that are doing graphic design or the people that come in to answer the phones or whatever that looks like that's part of your team. Part of executing and completing tasks is to keep them motivated as well, to energize them, to celebrate them, to help them understand the importance of their particular role. Over communication with your stakeholders is key. And I think that's an area that a lot of church communications can grow in. And we'll get into this more at the end of today's webinar, but over communicating with the ministry leaders, with your volunteers, with outside stakeholders, over communicating them will make a huge difference throughout the project management and execution phase. And also, as you're going through this, you make adjustments. Uh, you've created those contingencies, so you enable them or you make adjustments to deadlines, whatever that looks like. Executing uh, and completing tasks involves making adjustments as well. The last phase is closing the project. This is when you hand over the project Say it's a ministry event. You hand over all the materials that is that are needed to the owner. So that could be the ministry leader. And obviously, as the communicator, this may look different because a lot of what's being communicated comes through you as the church communicator. But you hand over the project at its end to its owner. That may also mean that you simply ask for their feedback. And we'll get into that in a second. As part of closing the project, you evaluate how you felt things went. What went well? Um, what could be changed? Uh, one of our articles that I didn't include in the resources, but I will uh, after the fact, is an after action review. We wrote an article on this a couple years ago, and it's a great way to evaluate after the fact, after an event, how it went. What went well? What could be improved? What do we need to change? And that will impact your future projects. So that cycle again. So evaluate yourself, how things went. Also connect with stakeholders, the ministry leaders, the owner of the, the event or whatever that is. When you hand it over to them, ask for their feedback or after the event, ask for their feedback. Connect with them and involve them all throughout the process. And then last is celebrate. Don't forget to celebrate because it is so important to think through, celebrate your volunteers, to honor them and support them. And often what is, you know, what is celebrated is repeated is what Rick Warren said. So make sure that you are taking time to celebrate the success of what you uh, just completed as a project. Maybe it was great social media engagement. Maybe it was something small like that. Maybe it was huge turnout for an outreach event. Whatever you can celebrate as you close the project, as you review this project together, make sure that you take time to celebrate and don't overlook that. So that's the project life cycle. You, you have a target, you have a goal, and this cycle helps you complete or reach that goal, right? That target. You initiate the project by creating a plan. You execute the project and its tasks, and then you close. You uh, review and you make changes for the next project. That is the project life cycle in a very quick nutshell. Um, but I hope that that in itself is a little bit helpful for you as you think through how you manage projects, how you communicate, and what it looks like in your context as well. I want to give you an example uh, of what this looks like in a ministry that we have been involved with over the last year. New Hope Community Ministries is uh, a ministry out of New Jersey. They are not a church. They are a uh, service organization. And I'll show you the details in just a second. But uh, New Hope did some incredible work over this last year. And I think it shows the, the project life cycle in a really clear and really well laid out way of doing things. So New Hope is, um, first of all, they are a Church Juice grant recipient for last year. So this if you're not aware, we have a grant program um, that is open right now to receive applications. Um, so if you would like to receive a grant or more information about that, at the end, you'll get uh, details about how to do that. But last year, New Hope was one of our recipients for our church communications and marketing grants. 
They are a ministry out of Prospect Park, New Jersey, which is Metro New York, essentially, if you're not familiar with the area. Um, it is a an area that um, has been overlooked by a lot of ministries and organizations and government agencies. And so New Hope is delivering um, ministry to people in their community in a way that helps them break through cycles of poverty and with the goal of creating a flourishing community as people break out of poverty. So one of the issues that they faced and they saw it as they were um, going through the pandemic is that they needed more bilingual materials and they needed to increase the awareness of their programs. They have, in some areas of their ministry, they have some uh, capacity to increase their number of clients or people that they are serving. And so they used the grant to look at how to serve other places in their community in a bilingual way. And so they pitched to us uh, their grant that would provide more families um, living in poverty part to participate in their programs. So what they said in their pitch to us is that they want to invite more families living in poverty to participate in their programs. And they were going to do this by creating a marketing campaign over the last year. The marketing campaign included a bilingual mailer that was sent to all households in the two communities that they were serving or that they are hoping to increase um, the number of people that they are serving. They were going to create a mailer that was um, that was bilingual and also brochures that were going to be distributed at other community events in their area. What they saw is that both Halladen and Prospect Park, the communities that they are hoping to serve, have a large population of especially Spanish speaking people. And so they wanted to increase the awareness to especially that population, the non-English population in their community um, of their awareness and what they were doing. They also created a video and they used their mailers or their print, um, their offline materials to move people online to learn more about what they were, what they are as a ministry. And they did that by creating a um, another bilingual or Spanish primary uh, promotional video. So what they did when they were looking at this project, uh, when they received the grant, they first looked at what they needed to do. They saw a need in their uh, in their uh, ministry area, the area that they were serving. They saw the need to serve Spanish speaking families and that they were underserving that population, but it was such a need in their community. So they created very clear deadlines um, and very clear budgets and all of the things that are part of initiating a plan before they applied for the grants even. They realized that they needed to spend um, $2,000 on creating a video, another $2,000 on a mailer, on developing the mailer, de developing the mailer, excuse me, uh, another $2,000 on mailing it out. Um, and these are all just, I just made those numbers up, but you get the idea. They created a budget. They knew the need. They saw what they were needing to do. And they also created uh, what they saw as the target. So what was driving towards success and how were they going to define success? That was all a part of initiating the project. Then they created a plan and that plan was submitted as their grant proposal. So they were going to create this mailer and these brochures and these videos, and they were going to do it um, by this time. Um, they had to do it within a certain time frame of the, uh, of the grant program. Um, and so what they did is they created a plan and they promoted that uh, as their grant proposal or submitted that as their grant proposal. And then once they received the grant, they were able to execute. But they took a lot of time, even before executing, to go back to that plan and figure out in the months since they first initiated the project and the months and when they received the grant, what had changed and how do they develop um, an updated plan or what were the contingencies there? So before they executed, they went back and actually made some changes. To execute their plan, they went through and, of course, with creating a mailer, there's a lot of tasks that are involved and a lot of different people that are involved as well. So they knew that they were going to outsource the people that were designing and creating both their videos and their materials. So there were tasks involved with that and also people uh, who were overseeing the project on their staff that were interacting and engaging with each other. So they created clear tasks and all of the tasks were laid out with deadlines. And as those deadlines were completed, the project continued forward. 
And finally, the project actually went and got mailed and was uh, promoted in the community events this spring and this summer. And so that was executing. But then once they actually executed, once they sent out all of the materials and all of that, they looked at the results as well. As they closed out the project, they looked at the results. What could we have done better? Or what do we do better next time we do this? How can we tweak the videos and make changes so that people um, find that connection or that felt need and dive into more information about how we can support them? Um, they evaluated uh, what they can do differently to reach the Hispanic population in their community. And they made other changes based on the feedback from those who um, came to their ministry, their food bank, or whatever it was. Um, they, made, they made changes to their promotional materials based on the feedback that they were receiving in real time as well. This was all part of, part of a project life cycle that they worked through as they thought through this grant program through, through their need and how to evaluate um, their projects as they went through and, um, and address the needs in their community as well. And there are a ton of other um, ways that we can look at the project life cycle and see how ministry is involved uh, in a variety of ways throughout this process. As we look at sermon series, how do you initiate, plan, execute, and close? As you look at outreach events coming up this fall or Christmas or Easter, or ministry events that are happening all throughout the school year? How do you involve the project life cycle into your overall communication process and strategy? So there are a few different methods that you can use for project management. So you have the project management life cycle, and that is the key area that I want to highlight. But there are a lot of different ways that you can enable and engage project management. So I just want to spend a couple minutes highlighting a lot of the most popular project management methods so that you at least have an understanding or a vocabulary to go back and do your own research to figure out what, uh, what works best for you. And the reason for that is because, like I said at the beginning, there's no one size fits all for projects. And so some projects may involve one types of method uh, and another may involve another type of, of method for executing a project. So these are just a few um, of the key areas for, um, for uh, involving and executing projects. The first, and I think the most popular, is called the waterfall method for project management. It is the traditional approach of what you would think about when you think through project and project management. So there are tasks, there are phases, and there are, mar there are milestones, but they are completed in linear order. You can't do X before you do A. Um, so each stage must be completed before the next one can begin. So think of it as steps or as waterfalls or as a waterfall, sorry. Um, as water moves down the rocks, that's kind of what you're thinking through here. So the project manager is responsible in the waterfall method for prioritizing and assigning tasks. And the criteria for quality and outcomes are also defined at the very beginning. So this is probably the most popular, um, but there's another popular approach that I wanna spend a, a minute on. But at the very core, Waterfall method is the traditional uh, approach when you're thinking of project management or projects and tasks. So you complete this task and then you do this and then you do that. And at some point you'll get to the goal. Another um, popular method for project management is called agile. So there are short phases of collaboration. Um, there's frequent testing and regularly imp implemented improvements. So what that means is that a lot of the tasks or phases or milestones, they may happen simultaneously. So it's not a, we design this, then we print it, and then we send it. It is, um, we are doing this, and as we do it, we're also evaluating and making changes. That could be something like your website, creating a new website. You create the template, you ask for feedback, you make some changes, you move forward. In this, in an agile um, uh, framework teams are also sharing responsibilities a lot of times. And so there's a lot of moving and interdependent parts that are happening throughout the process. Just very quickly, kind of a visual for you. Uh, if you're visual like me, hopefully this is a little bit more helpful. This is the waterfall model versus the agile, um, giving you just a little bit of the step-by-step -step and what that looks like. Um, so this would be something like if you're creating an app or you're developing your website, uh, this might be a good example for you to look at. In the waterfall, you'll see that you first look at the requirement and you uh, analyze it. Um, 
Then you move on forward to the next step. You look at that's requirements and its analysis. Then you move to the next, so on and so forth. In the agile, you look at those requirements and analysis, but then you also design, you implement, you test, then you develop, and then you go back and you look again, you evaluate, um, you analyze, and you make changes, and then eventually you launch. So hopefully that's a little bit of a more visual way for you to, to look at it and think about it. Um, hopefully that's helpful to you too. But these are two of the most popular ways that people approach project management. Um, I think that the agile method does have some um, some validity in church communications, depending on what you're working on. That could be something like a longer term communication event. So uh, maybe your midweek ministry, um, you start by promoting it at the beginning of the year, but then you need to make changes in how you're promoting it. And you do that throughout the process of the ministry year. There are other um there are other ministry events or programs that have clear deadlines and you move toward that as you complete tasks. Those are kind of the differences between waterfall and agile. Some other approaches that I'm going to touch on just real quick so that you at least uh, see them and have a little bit of an understanding of what they are. Uh, the lean method is something that I spent some time learning on earlier this year and it was created out of um, actually, out of Japan, the Toyota Corporation created the Lean Method. Um, it uses five pillars, and I'm not going to get into all that, but it uses five pillars to eliminate waste, save money, improve quality, and streamline processes. And it does this in eight areas of business. But essentially, what you're doing in the Lean Method is you're always looking at ways that you can um, uh, reduce waste. So you can do what they say in the lean method is that you can do more with less by addressing dysfunctions that create waste. So this isn't really um, something that gets implemented a whole lot in uh, in churches and in church communications. But there are some areas that I think um, using the project life cycle, we can use parts of this lean method and look at what's creating waste um, or how are we being dysfunctional? How do we uh, improve our functionality, our effectiveness, and we can use those lean principles in the project management lifecycle by evaluating what we're doing, reviewing it, and implementing new changes uh, to create a better system the next time we do a project. Another popular method that you'll see throughout project management is Six Sigma. Um, so it follows a process improvement approach called DMAIC, and that stands for define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. So it's really trying to control uh, the outcomes of a project and make sure that there's consistency is really what the Six Sigma, Six Sigma approach is trying to accomplish. Um, but there are other areas here that you can look at and maybe implement in different areas of, pro of your church communications project management as well. Finally, there is a a combined approach between Lean and Six Sigma, Six Sigma, where it combines both of these approaches and it's often used in big projects that are trying to save money, improve quality, and move through processes fairly quickly. So it takes part of Lean and it takes part of Six, Sig Six Sigma, for some reason I can't say that, uh, and it combines them so that what, they're, what you're trying to do in this is um, improve your effectiveness and make make changes quickly. And um, you're trying to save money at, because it's created for business. So obviously that's always important, but also improve quality. So this could be something like um, how you look at the wayfinding uh, signage throughout your building or things like that, um, trying to make those types of changes more quickly. So one other area that um, isn't really a method, but kind of a visual tool that a lot of people use. It's another approach uh, for project management um, that could be both physical, so um, so in real life, or it could be online. A lot of project management tools have this, this Kanban um, type of visual to help you see where things are throughout the project management status, essentially. So it is a tool that provides visual feedback about the status of the work, whether it's in trouble, whether it's completed, whatever that looks like. Um, and it's often used in both agile and lean methods, but even in the waterfall method of, um, of project management, you can use the Kanban um, method because there's a lot of 
like social media or a lot of things where you have lots of projects happening. And so you can use these cards or post-it notes or whatever it is uh, to keep track of what's where along your project management process. So categories might include to do, in progress or done. Um, here's a visual again, just to give you something to look at here. Um, so uh, for example, I use Asana as project management, uh, as a project management tool. And you'll see in my Asana projects that I use a lot of these categories. And I also use the Kanban, whether it's waterfall or agile, um, I use the Kanban as a visual way to see where I'm at with certain projects. So sometimes it's just helpful to, to organize in that way. Um, so know that that's another tool that you can use, um, whether it's with post-it notes, kind of like this uh, picture shows, or it's um, using Asana or another project management tool. And a lot of a lot of them, like Trello, are created just as a Kanban system. Uh, and so it kind of forces you into that, which can be a good discipline as well. So let's take just a couple minutes because we're running a little bit behind. I talk too much, apparently. Um, how do you implement this? So I've spent the last 40 minutes talking about how um, what project management looks like for church communications. How do you implement this new knowledge? I think there's a few things. First, don't skip the first two phases of the project life cycle. I think most church communicators, myself included, we overlook the initiate plan and often the close as well. We initiate or we overlook those for just the execution. And it's easy to get stuck in that because we have so much ha happening, so many different projects happening at the same time. We have so much on our plate. I realize that. Um, but when you initiate the full project management life cycle, it's going to help you improve in so many different ways. Second, move from reactive to proactive. So when you are using the full project management life cycle, um, it helps force you to move into a proactive way of communicating, of looking at communication events. So what does that look like practically? I think it's helpful if you create a centralized ministry calendar. Um, so create one calendar, if you don't already have it, create one calendar that's just for your staff, um, but it takes all of the ministry events that are happening throughout the year and puts it in one place. That's easy for you to find. It's easy for someone else to find as they're looking through and planning events to see what is happening in different areas of ministry. So that may mean that you need to take the, the reins and make sure that that happens. But creating a centralized calendar for your ministry, for all of your ministries in your church or organization, um, everything that's happening in one place will help you move from reactive to proactive and help you look at the project management life cycle. And we'll get into that in a second. Once you have that centralized one calendar, periodically gather your leaders, the ministry leaders, whether they're volunteer or staff or whatever, get them together annually, semi-annually, quarterly, whatever that looks like, get them together in one room in one place and get a meta level, a 30,000 foot view of upcoming events. Oftentimes, when I was um, in church ministry overseeing communications, we took an annual staff retreat. And part of that retreat was taking a look at the next 12 months, the next calendar year or ministry year, whatever that looks like, um, and planning out the major events that are happening. And of course, things pop up throughout the year um, or get added to the calendar. But you have a good bird's eye level view of everything that's happening over a longer period of time. And that will help create your centralized calendar when you gather all those people together. The next way that we can stop being reactive and be more proactive is to stop relying on request forms. A lot of people have pushed over the last few years, a lot of church communicators have pushed over the last few years that we need to, re re we need to create a request form so that people fill it out, we know what they want and they submit it to us and then we can get it done, right? The problem is that you are asking your people to fill out a form. So it, uh, it decreases your interpersonal communication, your involvement with one another. It also is asking your ministry leaders to do one more, one more thing. Um, and often it doesn't work very well. I don't think that you need to get rid of the request form altogether, um, but I do think it has its place. Um, so in its place, in, in place of the request form, I say you'd be proactive, schedule meetings 
with the key stakeholders and look at those upcoming events. There are many reasons for that. When you schedule the meeting, you get everyone together in one room rather than a form. And you talk about what's happening six weeks or eight weeks or three months from now that needs to start planning now that you need to start working on now because you're probably thinking about it before they are, depending on what it is. So your next sermon series event or next ser sermon series or event, start looking now, schedule a meeting, get all of the people in one room and talk about um, how you're going to create that plan and initiate the project with one meeting. As a result of that meeting, use a brief, uh, one document that has all the details. This is the look and feel we want. These are the deliverables that we need and when we need them. Uh, this is who is involved in the project and at each phase. Create a brief to initiate the project and help you make the plan. That's all in place of a request form. It is more work at the forefront, but guess what? When you put a meeting on the calendar and you get all the people that are involved in one space at one time and have the conversation, you're now in charge of the timeline. And it's working more in your favor because you have time to get things done rather than a two-day deadline from using a design request form. All right, next, improve your internal communication. Involve stakeholders. What I mean by that, involve your volunteers. Involve the ministry leader. Involve the people who are running the events or the ministry. Involve them throughout the plan and the execute phases. Involve them uh, by over communicating about milestones and delays. Communicate with them. Uh, create a regular pattern of communication. Maybe that's every Wednesday you send an email with an update on where you're at, what's going on, what you need. And then decide what you can be delegating to others. Maybe you need to go back to the ministry leader and ask for their feedback. Maybe it's something else that you can delegate up or down to volunteers or other staff, um, but decide what can be delegated. And last, don't forget to evaluate. Evaluate your processes, find ways to improve. That way your projects are always making improvements. You're always working toward 1% better and ask for feedback from people outside your team as well. So um, a lot of the same feedback can happen when you involve the same people all the time. So involve others, involve people who are receiving the communication or um, maybe that are less inclined to actually read an email. Find out how you can do better Then celebrate, of course, like we talked about. Celebrate with your stakeholders, with your volunteers. Don't forget to celebrate. Honor them, recognize them, support them, celebrate them. All right. There are a few resources that I want to make sure that you have available to you. Um, this slide is available in your handouts and all of those uh, titles and um, links are clickable. So make sure that you download it. Um, but you can get information about the grant program. You can get our communication strategy guidebook. It's a great way to help you just build a church communication strategy from scratch. There's also an article there that I included about your church's internal communications. Um, the PMI, Project Management Institute, is a great way to find out more about um, project management and how you can actually get certified in project management and learn more. And then last, you can also schedule a free consultation with me. I love to serve you, serve your support, support you however I can. And then last, next week, I'm going to send you a creative brief template and help you learn how to move from design request forms to moving toward uh, project briefs, um, design briefs, creative briefs, whatever you want to call them. So I'll send you a template for that and how to implement it uh, next week. So Juliana, you did ask one question that I want to touch on real quick. Tips for organizing piles of to-dos. One thing that I didn't touch on today, um, which maybe I should have, is there is um, something called the Eisenhower matrix um, for decision making. So it creates uh, so President Eisenhower kind of created or crafted this method or is, he didn't actually create it, but some for some reason it's uh, attributed to him. So what it does is it looks at the urgent, it looks at the important, and then it looks at the opposite of that, the non-urgent and the non-important. So you have four squares and you decide what you need to do right now, what's urgent and what's important, what you can schedule to do later. So what's important but not urgent what you can delegate, so what is not urgent and not important, and then what you can trash or what you can get rid of or 
give back to the person. Don't worry about it. Do it when you have free time. And that is non-urgent, non-important. So if you Google um, the Eisenhower matrix, I think that is really helpful for me when I feel overwhelmed. It's really helpful for me just to like take a whiteboard and figure out all these tasks that I have and put them in the different quadrants and figure out what really is priority and what isn't. Um, and I think that's that's helpful for me. Hopefully that would be helpful for you. I know that there's a big pile of to-dos in most communicators um, that I interact with. Um, most of you as a church communicator, I know that you have uh, different responsibilities and roles. Um, and so hopefully uh, if you implement something like like that matrix, that might help you kind of prioritize what is what's urgent and what's important and what do I need to do right now and how can I kind of organize the rest of that as well? So hopefully that's helpful. I don't see any other questions coming in. Let me check the chat window. Yeah, so if you have any questions, again, feel free to reach out to me. The handout is available. Again, make sure you download that. Uh, you can schedule a quick call with me anytime you'd like. Send me an email. Be happy to answer any questions, any follow-up that you have. I hope that you found today helpful and beneficial. Um, and look forward to next month's webinar. We will join the third Thursday, I think that's September 15th. Um, and we're going to take a look uh, at an organization called Ministry Pass. We're gonna hear from them about some tools and how to do um, a lot of planning and different things that I think you will find helpful. So I'm excited about that. Stay tuned for details. Um, that'll be coming in the next couple of weeks. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you for joining um, and hope that you found this valuable. Again, if I can do anything for you, please feel free to reach out. Um, but have a great day. Thank you.